everyone. I know extremely little about archaeology, so making that link, I apologise. I will give kind of ideas <coughs> from my point of view, but I hope that you'll make the connection to archaeology. My experience of archaeology has been spending um, three days <coughs> over with Waterloo Uncovered in the summer, where I had a crash course in it. Beyond that, I'm afraid I know nothing. Um, so I'm not going to pretend that I'm an expert in that, but I am an expert in some other bits. So um, I have to put X now because I'm no longer the professional lead advisor for occupational therapy in the MOD, but I was until last year uh, for about 20 years for my sins. Um, and in that role, not only was it my um, responsibility to look at patients' overall well-being and, you know, what the hell does that word mean? We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But another part of my role was to look at um, charitable organisations and projects that were being set up to support uh, military personnel. And there were many, many, many of those. Um, and it was partly up to me to identify what that role would offer for the patients, what would suit them, what wouldn't suit them, what, what particular kind of thought things each project could bring, um, and whether it would suit our guys. So I have seen many, 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 many charitable projects through the years being set up and offered to my patients. Um, and I can safely say, and it's not just because I'm here, that the Waterloo Uncovered project probably ticks more boxes than the others do. And I obviously don't say that to anyone else. So um, that's my experience really. Now I work privately, I'm a consultant for OT, I'm a counsellor, so I suppose I think about wellbeing quite a lot. Um, but what I want to really do is explain it from an occupational model, because I think wellbeing we straight away think about old people and how they're feeling or you know are people a bit happy or they but actually well-being is 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 i think way more than that so i'm going to show you quite a complicated thing but you'll love it i know you will <laughs> oh my god <laughs> so this That's next half hour. oh my god i know i could literally stand here all day and talk about this but i'm absolutely keeping an eye on the time um so occupational therapy run by this model it's called the moho model of human occupation um, initiated by Kiel Hofner in the early 2000s and we've kind of worked and fiddled around with it a lot since then. You can see well-being is, is on the left there, but in occupational terms we see well-being as part and parcel of um, a person's kind of uh, holistic being. And actually we would consider as OTs occupational performance in the middle of that and occupational participation and we would see well-being as kind of falling out from that. Um, but if we look at all the things around the sides, um, I won't um, insult you by saying how archaeology fits into this, but I will talk a bit kind of generally at the end. But you can see when we think about occupation, um, and by that we don't mean a job, we mean everything that we do. So an OT believes occupation is the ability to wake up in the morning, the ability to get out of bed and want to, all the way through to managing our lives in a way that makes it meaningful for us. Why am I getting out of bed in the morning? Is there a point to it? Yes, there is, thank God. So all of these things um, really support that. So I'm sure as you look down here, you can see how archaeology and the Waterloo Uncovered um, project supports an, a huge number actually of those things and I'll talk specifically in a moment but I think this model's great because I think I think if you talk about well-being more along the lines of emotional psychological you miss this whole occupational piece and it's huge unless you're 90 maybe and you and, and you know you just want to look at the emotional side most of the people that that Mark is marketing his his um charity to are people who are still in the prime of their lives, they still want to be achieving, they still want meaning, they want purpose, um, and that is what this occupational performance model uh, supports. 
So when I went on the dig, see I've got one word, dig. When I went on the dig, um, I had this model in my mind as I was going around looking at what people were doing while I was talking to people, I was really kind of trying to tap into what it meant for them with this model in the back of my mind. Obviously, we can come back to that if you'd like to stare at it later, because I am very proud of it, but I'm, I'm already over five minutes in. So, if you want to hone down to a little bit more of a kind of well-being idea, looking at it from a more kind of psychological, emotional perspective, um, this is one of the models used, and this, this is still in line with an occupational bias. So, if you put in... Uh, well-being models into Google, you will come up with many, 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 many of them. And they've all got slightly different emphases depending on what they're trying to promote. This is one that I like with regards to Waterloo Uncovered because it's very much about all the things that I think Waterloo promotes. So the empowerment, I mean, people talk about empowerment all the time, I don't think, and I don't really like that word all that much because I think it's a bit American. Um, but what empowerment means to me is that engagement, that desire to engage with the world and feel like you've got a place in the world. Um, and actually that whole, I can make a difference, is probably one of the sentiments that I heard most when I was going around chatting to the guys and girls who were on the dig. They really felt that every single little thing that they were doing each day was part of something bigger and was actually making a difference. And if you want to be as purist as I sometimes am, the difference is that hole is bigger now than it was earlier, and you did that. So it's very tangible, it's very obvious, it's very physical. You know, not, not all ex-soldiers work on an ethereal level. They want to see the nuts and bolts of what they do. The nuts and bolts of what they do is that they've dug that today, and they found three bits of shot which have gone off and are being investigated by somebody else. So they've made a difference. They can see what they're doing in every way. The self-efficacy thing is obviously huge. We're always looking at self-efficacy, particularly with soldiers and veterans. It's something that isn't promoted in them that much always. So certainly as an OT, I was always really looking at self-efficacy. And that's something, again, that I really noticed um, on the dig is that people were just given carte blanche pretty much to go on work on what they wanted to work with, work with who they wanted to work with, um, and actually take some control about what they wanted. If they wanted to stop and have a break and go and have a bottle of water, they could. There was no one dictating what they did. Um, and they certainly felt that they had control over what they were doing. Um, everyone is treated as if they are quite special. So I expect the best. Such a nice team. In fact, I think there are as many team members, tell me if I'm wrong, Mark, as there are uh, clients, whatever you call them. So actually, all of these people, they've got everybody running around after them. You know, Katie and everybody else are there to cater to their every whim. And I know that they feel very special while that's going on. Uh, that can't happen unless you've got a high staff ratio and you've got staff who really do give a shit and really do want to help the people that are there. Um, and that gives them that optimism. Oh my goodness, I'm worth it. Someone's just asked me how I am. Someone just bought me over another bottle of water. Wow, I am important. And that's something that they don't, they don't all feel much of when they're in their normal lives. Part of that is the self-esteem, I'm valuable. Um, and that belonging thing is, is probably key with regards to um, veterans and how they often feeling in their normal lives. So people who have been in the military know that they are part of a team, they're part of a big family, and it feels very safe and very nurturing for most people. Um, then they become a civvy and they lose that. And that's what lots and lots of veterans report, that they just they feel isolated, they don't feel part of something bigger anymore. So that I belong to a team thing, that belonging thing is, is you know, okay, they get it only for that week, while they're there, but they really do feel that. They're in mini teams, which is part of a bigger team. They all know how they fit in. They all know their place in that team. Uh, and they're all respected for the role that they play within that team as well. So that's actually an occupational model to well-being. Um, and as I say, there are many, 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 many others. And if that doesn't suit your particular needs, 
um, then there is there are so many others. Um, Mark did say in my spiel um, that I would be talking about outcome measures, which I don't have time really to do today. However, <laughs> if I, he was gambling away thinking I had hours, um, there are so many outcome measures out there. Again, depending on what you want to use, there's self-efficacy outcome measures, which I think are brilliant because self-efficacy generally leads to self-esteem and increased occupation and function. Um, but there are outcome measures out there for everything. I suppose, and, and you know, if you want to ask me what outcome measures I use for various things, you're enormously welcome obviously to get in touch. Um, but there are many, many. I suppose a word of warning would be make sure that the outcome measure that you're interested in is really, really assessing what you want to find out. Because a lot of outcome measures can miss the point and the information that you're left with is pretty much useless. So what do you want to know? Find the outcome measure that answers that question. But there, are, honestly, there are so many. And I can, if you invite me back for another one another time, I could go on a whole spiel on outcome measures. But I don't want to bore you. OK, so some of the things as I was going around talking to people, what, what was I really picking up? You know, what was, the, what was the unique selling point for Waterloo Uncovered? What was different about that? Why would I recommend that veterans went to do a Waterloo Uncovered uh, week rather than any other of the charitable projects that I know about? As I said earlier, there are many, many out there. So what is, what, what is it different that you, that you get out of this archaeological dig project? And this feeds back into um, the occupational um, model. So the first one, and I love this as an OT, OT is all about purpose. There's a real sense of purpose. Everyone knows why they're there. Now, that might sound really obvious, but it actually isn't. And a lot of people will go on things. I have to say, particularly military and veteran people, they go, oh, oh, did you say there was something free going on? No idea what it's about, but I'll go anyway. Not all that helpful. And they come out the other side of it going, mm, well, it was OK. What did you gain? Mm, not really sure what I was there for. This is completely different. Everyone knows what their goal is. And everyone seems really motivated to achieve that goal. And that was kind of the first thing that struck me, I suppose, that everyone was so enthusiastic about achieving this goal. Um, and it was all the same goal. So that whole pulling together thing to achieve something was, was, was a huge thing and lots of people reported that to me. The sense of belonging, vital for the military. The military love to belong. Of course they do, that's what they're used to. So that sense of belonging is so, so, so important. As I say, in, in the present time, the sense of belonging around what's going on now, but also much bigger, and that feeds into the third one as well, is this belonging to um, a history, a military history that's gone on, that when they joined uh, the armed forces, they became part of that group. And that's really strong, and that means a lot to them. And the fact that they're, re you know, they're rediscovering stuff and they're finding out new information about what went on, they're, they're, they're excited and motivated to find out what people like them were like and what they did all those years ago. The rich mix of uh, veterans um, was, was interesting and, it's, and a little bit dicey at times, wasn't it? But actually lovely because you've got, you know, different countries coming together. You've got veterans from different walks of life coming together. Um, and actually, you know, there's a little bit of uh, lighthearted bants going on between all of the countries. But, but basically, everyone seemed to really enjoy hearing things from other people's points of view, which you don't get often. You don't get often. So this was something that I had not appreciated at all. And both archaeologists that I chatted to and military people that I chatted to both reported this to me and I hadn't processed it at all. Um, but this, I suppose this, you know, adapt and overcome idea that archaeologists have and military people have, plonk me down in the middle of nowhere, give me no resources at all, and I'm gonna achieve. Um, well, that's what I'm getting. And, you know, I hadn't appreciated how 
tough archaeologists were, uh, but now I do, I promise you. Um, and it is similar, you know, it is risky. It, there's, there, there are a lot of variables that you have to put up with. Um, and that's the same with the military. You know, it's not it's not ordered. You don't you don't definitely know that where you go is going to be uh, comfortable and safe, and things aren't bad things aren't going to happen. Where you're going to have to try and change your plans and do risk assessments off off the cuff. Um, apparently, sometimes you have to stay somewhere where there's no showers and you're all dirty all the time. <laughs> Clearly not my bag. I love working with all of you people, but I don't like actually doing it. Um, <laughs> But, but again, I think military people are quite scathing of civvies. And I'm allowed to say that because I've worked with them for 25 years. Um, this whole, you know, oh, you're a bit soft, you're soft underbelly. You know, uh, but, that, but they have respect for the archaeology people because the archaeology people have done the same thing. You know, they've roughed it. I guess they've been in difficult circumstances and people like me obviously haven't. Therefore, I can't possibly understand what they've been through. And I get that, and I don't, I don't mind, I accept that. Um, they can just tell me about it, but I don't want to do it. So, mindfulness, massive word. It's been blown out of proportion, it upsets me. I used to talk about it a lot, and I, have, I don't so much now because there's so many mindfulness crayon books and stuff that uh, it upsets me. But <laughs> mindfulness is, is, is obviously the route to well-being, you know? So much neuroscience now supports this. I won't bore you with all of that, but that's another whole big talk I could do. Mindfulness in the brain. I mean, seriously, um, we know what mindfulness does to our brain, not necessarily about crayons and colouring, but actually being at the dig and working mindfully um, in, in, in the way that they did is um, second to none, really. There are a few activities that you do where you become so engrossed. And we know that that is basically mindfulness. You don't have to feel raisins and sniff chocolate or whatever. Um, you can instead go on an archaeological dig. And that is probably one of the most mindful things that you could be invited to do. Of course, being outdoors, of course, being in natural surroundings. I mean, I, again, I could talk about this forever. We know about all the research um, that supports well-being and, and healing even. Um, being outside, being in, being in nature. Um, in uh, Birmingham, when we were uh, kazibacking all of our guys back from Afghan, what they, what, what they did sort of six months in, what they realised was if they had television screens of the outdoors, if they put up big pictures of trees, etc., people's healing increased. And that's not like a weird thing, it's a real thing. So rather than pictures, let's get people outside properly. Um, don't get me started on the screens. I simply, as you can see, simply can't bear a screen. So I didn't actually see anyone sneaking a look at their phone, I don't think, at all, which makes me so happy. So something about the outdoors was really, really working for people. Physical activity is fairly obvious. I can definitely remember one gentleman saying, are you sure I'm meant to be digging this enormous hole all by myself? Do you know I'm 63? <laughs> Which I thought was quite funny. But apart from him, everyone really enjoyed the physical activity. Um, I think that maybe was a bit mean for him. But uh, it took him a week, but he did it in the end. Um, and actually, it can be, apart from uh, he, he, his activity was graded in the end. I think he was just probably complaining. But um, it certainly was graded. Most of the people that I saw on that particular project were physically relatively capable. There were some with impairment, in which case they were risk assessed and their, their physical um, activity was paced appropriately. So, um, don't worry, don't worry about it. Keep going. So I've I, done 20. I'm okay, no, I've done. I'm so, I've stopped. The end. <laughs>